Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar of the year. Uh, it's going to be an incredible semester already, a uh, record-breaking number of students. And so um, just glad that you are here with us. We'll give everybody a second to, to log on, uh, and then, we can, uh, then we'll get started with the content. But while you're logging on, let me just say glad, glad you're here. Uh, glad to be joined by Dr. Phil Brassfield. Hey, everybody. <laughs> All the way from Heber Springs, Arkansas. Uh, Dr. Rasfield and I will uh, join. Let me just tell you a couple things. Uh, if you look on the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will, uh, you'll see a chat box and a Q&A box. Uh, please utilize the chat box just to comment. Let us know that you're here. Uh, and then you can utilize the Q&A box if you have any specific questions that you want Dr. Rasfield and I to see. There's a lot going on in that chat, so we won't be able to monitor it there. Uh, but if you want, uh, if you have a question that you want us to try to tackle, you can you can enter it in uh, uh, to the Q and A box. Uh, a couple reminders for those of you who are returning, and new information for those of you who are just attending. Uh, you are given a grade based on your participation in these. Um, those are entered manually, and it will take us a couple of days to do that. So please give us a little time uh, to enter it in. And I would say by by this weekend, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, you can feel free to email Becca, uh, who you've all been communicating with. But until then, uh, just give us a little time. A uh, couple other housekeeping things before we turn it over and let Dr. Brassfield introduce himself is if you uh, are, you need to go to be going to destinyleaders.instructure.com. If you just go to instructure.com, which is the, the, the home of Canvas, uh, you're not going to be able to log in. It's not going to send you the right link to create an account. So you want to go to destinyleaders.instructure.com. You can also download the Canvas app and search for Destiny Leaders within the Canvas app, and you can uh, access everything on a on an app there. Um, well, so Dr. Brassfield, uh, we have the largest enrolling class ever, uh, the most students we've ever had enrolled in DLI at one time ever, and so what a great way to kick it off uh, on a on a beautiful. September evening with you and I. We've been doing this together for 11 years now. And so uh, let's let's get another year started. What do you think? I can't wait. Honestly, I'm so proud of, first of all, all of you guys, the staff and all the faculty and, and all the students, the churches that are involved. We just say welcome to everybody. Uh, this is perhaps the beginning of one of the greatest adventures of your life and the foundation of what God's going to do in your ministries. And and uh, I, I, for years, I always said, and I don't do these that much anymore, but I always said to, to students that I know this is a leadership institute, but let me just tell you right off the bat, none of you are called to lead. Not a single one of you are called by God to lead. You're all called to serve. And in your service, God will grant you influence. And our goal over the next couple of years is to help coach you and teach you how to manage the influence God gives you while you serve his people. And I think the heart of DLI is servant leadership. And so welcome aboard, everybody. Uh, you know, buckle up. Here we go. It's going to be a great, great uh, couple of years for those returning students. Uh, great last year. And just welcome all of our students, those that are in various programs. Uh, we're excited to have you all. And a big part of what Destiny offers is so much more than DLI. We have the annual conference. Uh, we have a magazine. We have all kinds of resources and support for pastors and Christian leaders. Uh, but one thing that would make your DLI experience really cool will be uh, joining us live at a Connect event this fall. So uh, we have four different locations. Uh, Dr. Russell, tell us a little bit about the Connect events and why our students should, should come out to one of those. Well, it's about relationship. I mean, that's why we call them a Connect event. Um, you know, one of the things that Destiny has kind of been affectionately called over the years is a covenant family of friends. We don't want to just train you and equip you for your ministry at the local level. We want you to join a community of people that are studying, uh, people that are serving, uh, from senior pastors of mega churches to church planters to every department of the church that you can imagine in between. Uh, and, and those who may never serve uh, vocationally in, say, a paid position, but want to know more about the scripture and how they can be uh, uh, more effective serving in their local church. We want a community to emerge, and we've seen that, and we call it a covenant family of friends, and we want you to be part of that. 
And that's not just through your educational experience with us, but uh, but through your life of ministry and service. And so uh, Landon's showing the Connect event schedule. Uh, this is the four for this fall. Uh, there'll be some more events that are breaking in the spring. And so those uh, news about that, of course, will come out. But these are not preacher meetings. This is like our annual summer conference. It's about our family getting together. And uh, there'll be breakouts. There'll be music, food, and fellowship. Typically this year, they are a Thursday night fellowship and party, and then Friday labs and lunch, and then a, a big service on Friday night. Some will have a Saturday morning uh, impartation service uh, in the morning. So, hey, you know, uh, get a shot spiritual in the arm while you're studying and, and look at the one that's nearest you. And if you want to travel, you don't have to just go to the one that's nearest you. Pick out one that, uh, let me tell you, Pennsylvania is beautiful in November. I can tell you that from experience. And uh, Lancaster County is in, uh, in, is in the heart of Amish country. It's a beautiful spot if you've never been there. So pick out one of those and join us. Wonderful. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Brasso, let's uh, just get into the topic for tonight. We don't have, I you know, really just have a, a pretty simple goal uh, for this evening together. And that is to encourage the students just first of all, just to just to dive all the way in. Uh, let me actually start with a story. So uh, I know you were very jealous because you wanted to accompany me, but I went skydiving this weekend. And yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I knew you, I promised you I wouldn't go without you. And and I so I'm so sorry that I left you. I'm so disappointed, honestly, terribly <laughs> disappointed. Uh, but uh, I had a little bit of an adventure, though. Um, so the plane that I was on uh to uh to go skydiving we get on the runway uh we take off the propeller goes and dies on the runway so at this point i'm strapped in already I've, I've got all the gear on i've got a guy on my back like we are crammed in this tiny plane we are about to go and then uh all that adrenaline nothing happens and so they said well, why don't you get out go in the airport uh, we'll give you a free cookie because, you know, free cookie makes everything, <laughs> makes everything better. And so let us see if we can fix this plane. And so they said they fixed the plane. So we get back in, strapped up, adrenaline through the roof. Uh, and same thing happens on the runway, big buildup, almost in the air. Uh, there's a bubble in the fuel line, just cannot get off the ground and pilot didn't feel safe to do so. So like, okay, well, I guess it's not going to happen today. So they go back uh, to the headquarters and we're kind of waiting to see if they're going to do a refund or what's going to happen and they about an hour later they show back up and say hey we got the plane we got it we got it ready to go do, do you still want to go and at this point I had expected that to go around 10 o'clock and by now it's after two and my adrenaline had been up and down as so I, I wasn't even really sure anymore but I thought yeah you know let's just do it one more time and lo and behold we actually get up this time and and the and the plane is climbing uh, we ascend to 10,000 feet and I'm feeling pretty good. But then there's a moment where the door opens and you've got about five seconds to decide if you're going to roll off the plane or if you're going to stay put. And all that build up, will I, won't I, should I, shouldn't I, plane problems. So uh, let me say this, everyone who says, why would you jump off a perfectly good airplane? My plane was not a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> Apparently, Honestly, I was thinking as you were saying that, what do you got to lose? It's like, go <laughs> ahead and do it. I mean, it's you're going to jump anyway. Uh, so, uh, but there is, you know, there is that, that moment where you just have to decide whether you're going to do it or not. And I would encourage everyone starting the ELI, uh, if you will allow my stretch metaphor here. Uh, really, I just want to tell you that I went skydiving and I have to relate it something <laughs> to something somewhat applicable to you guys. Uh, but there is a point where you have to stop contemplating, am I, am I not, and just dive all the way in. And DLI is a great experience for those who are willing to roll off the plane, go all the way in. Uh, if you're still kind of counting the cost, and I don't know if I want to do the work, and I'll do it, but I can't commit too much time to it, this it will not be a great experience. But what we want to show you tonight is that we're just go, go all the way in, read all the books, don't take any shortcuts, do all the quizzes, watch all the videos, uh, really apply yourself. Don't find the shortcuts, to, you know, just to find a way to get things done, but but fully embrace uh, the the entire experience. That's awesome. <laughs> and you know, I heard it, I had a professor tell me one time, you know, it's like 
you're going to be older anyway. I mean, you're, in other words, two years, if the Lord tarries, it is going to be here. And you're either going to have a certificate and have mastered the subject matter, have that much additional knowledge, or you're going to be still wondering why you didn't do it. And so you're enrolled and you're here. So uh, to use your metaphor, jump. Yeah, just, just go for it. Yeah. Well, maybe one more metaphor, then we'll actually get into our content. So those of you who are watching uh, this webinar, you might you might remember um, if you've been with us for more than one semester that our internship course, these webinars, they sort of have a flow to them. Uh, one semester we talk about character because Dr. Brassett, I've heard you say uh, so many times that God cares much more about who you are than what you do. And we do a great disservice to students when we train them what they're supposed to do, but never teach them who they're supposed to be. And so we always start with character and, and, your, your spiritual disciplines, your prayer life, your integrity, who you are as a person. I, I would much rather you be an A-plus Christian and a C-minus leader or, or, a, or a D leader or an F leader than to be an A-plus leader and a, and a D-minus or an F uh, Christian. I think that's just, we've seen a lot of that lately, and it has to start with character. So we have a semester building your character, and then we move from character to calling. So how to identify and develop the call of God on your life, how to know what you're supposed to do and why you're doing it, so on and so forth. This semester then talks about capacity. And don't worry, these don't have to be sequential. You just jump in when you jump in. You're going to get all four at some point. Uh, but capacity is about increasing your capacity. So how can you be the best version of you? How can you be the absolute best? You can't uh, help how gifted you are. That was kind of up to God. Uh, sometimes in our culture, we like to say things like you can be anything you want to be, which isn't true. I can't be an NBA player. I'm not gifted that way. But however I'm gifted, I can be the very best at that. Uh, I can be the very best teacher that I can be, the very best preacher that I can be, the very best leader that I can be. Um, and so this semester is all about how to develop habits and disciplines uh, to get every ounce out of yourself. I'm a, I'm a lucky man that I have several pastors and leaders in my life. And one of my pastors, Pastor Brett Jones, often says that he does not want to die with seed in his pocket. That I don't want to, I don't want to expire knowing that there's something else I could have done or something else that I could have been. So that's what this semester, all four of our webinars will be about. Where uh, next month I'm excited I'll be live from Oasis Church. I see some Oasis, Oasis peeps uh, from Austin, uh, Round Rock, Texas uh, in the chat. And I'll be live with you guys and Bishop Jonathan Suber will be joining me for that one. So, but every time that we do one of these, uh, it's going to be along those lines uh, this semester is like, how can you get everything you can out of yourself? Um, how can you uh, reach in, so to speak, and, and pull out God's best for you? The next semester, the fourth, uh, fourth C that rounds out the cycle is church. So how can you take all this and apply it to your local context? And how can you serve the church better. So today we're talking a little bit about uh, about time management and about self-management because you're all taking on another responsibility. Uh, I know that none of you are going, you know what I need? I just need something else to do with my time. I just feel like I have, my days are too long. I'm bored. I need something else to do. No, all of you are busy enough. You, you have families, you have careers, uh, you're volunteering or serve, serving at your church. You've got a lot going on. And now you're adding another responsibility. And so in order to do that, you're going to have to get better at managing your time or manage, or like I like to say, managing yourself. Uh, because time management is a misnomer. Uh, you really can't manage time. Time is what it is. There's 24 hours a day. Everyone gets the same amount. You really can't manage time. You have to learn to manage yourself. Uh, and how you use that time. Uh, Dr. Brassett, I don't know if you remember this illustration, but it's it's been done before uh, where a, a speaker will take a vase and they'll put, uh, they'll invite the student to come up or, or someone to come up and say, hey, uh, I've got I've got all these, um, this gravel and water and stones, and I want you to fill it up. And over time, what you'll see is that if you put the gravel in first, there's no room for the big stones or for the water. Uh, if you put the water in first, you know, the, the gravel comes in, absorbs it, it expands, and you can't, can't get the stones in. The only way to make it work is you put the big rocks in first, then you pour the gravel on top, and the gravel will work its way into the stones, 
and then the water gets poured on and seeps into the, any, any holes that are remaining. So the only way to fit everything in your life is to identify and to determine what are the big rocks? What, what are the things that you're going to prioritize? And if DLI is one other thing that you're doing, just one of a of hundred other things, this will be a frustrating experience for you because it's too much. There's, there's too much going on. There's too many assignments. There's too many books. And so what we're encouraging you to do is to make it one of your big rocks. If you do not get the big rocks in first, you will not get them in at all. This lesson of the big rocks is actually found in the book of Haggai. Uh, Haggai is one of the last three Old Testament prophets. Uh, the other two being Zechariah, whose ministry overlapped Haggai's, and Malachi, who came along about 100 years later. So he's a minor prophet. Uh, suffice it to say that the minor prophets uh, are not called minor uh, but because they're less important, but because their, their books are shorter. Really, the minor prophets sort of say the same thing as the major prophets. They just do it in a lot less space. Um, they're preachers who are able to make the point in a lot. We know, we, we know minor preachers and major preachers. <laughs> uh, minor preachers are those who can make their point in 25 minutes. And then there's some of us that are major preachers. And it takes us about 45 minutes. So Isaiah and Malachi say a lot of the same things. It just takes Isaiah <laughs> a, long, a, lot, a, lot longer to, a lot longer to say it. So Haggai is one of these minor prophets. Uh, he is the first prophet for the returned exiles. So after Israel had been exil exiled uh, to Babylon, uh, the Persians replaced the Babylonians. The Persians give Israel favor, and uh, they're allowed to return back to the land to rebuild the city. And, and not too long after that, they, they laid the foundations of the temple in 536 B.C., and they encounter opposition, and they put the work on hold. So that's the context. So Haggai comes to a group of people who have been sent by God to rebuild the walls, to rebuild the city, but because they faced opposition, the work got put on hold. This relates to our culture today, where there's just so much opposition. Uh, there's so much division, uh, so much uh, just chaos around us. The the tragedy of the day. What are we outraged about today? Uh, who's mad about what? I mean, who's who said what? And if we're not careful, we can stop building the church, building God's kingdom, because there's just so much, so many distractions and so much opposition. And that was the situation of Haggai's uh, day. And so God sends Haggai uh, to say this. If you start in verse two of chapter one. Here's what Haggai says. Here's the very first words that come out of his mouth. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? The people said, we do not have time to rebuild God's house right now. And Haggai, without very much introduction, you know, when I start a sermon, I like to tell a funny story. Uh, I, I like to ease into what I have to say, but Haggai just jumps right in and says, you're saying you don't have time to build God's house. However, I'm looking and you're living in a pretty nice house. You don't have time to do God's work, but you have plenty of time to build a comfortable life for yourself. Uh, you don't have time to study and read. Yet, your Netflix, you don't miss very many shows. You're, you're all caught up on, on that. You, you don't have time to volunteer or to serve, but man, you're finding time to make sure your kids play every sport and dance every dance and do everything else. Like at some point you have to realize that you don't have a time problem. You have a priority problem. Uh, it, it's not, it's not that you don't have time to build God's house. It's just that you've chosen to use that time to build your own house and to build your own life. And that's how Haggai starts this conversation by reminding people that you always have time for what's important to you. You always have time for what's important to you. So then he continues, 
Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he, and he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. This is the problem with misplaced priorities is they overpromise and underdeliver. That you eat, but you're not full. You drink, but you're not satisfied. You, you work and you earn wages, but you put them into a bag with holes. Inflation, somebody, you know, so no matter how much you earn, it just seems like there's never enough to go through. And so here's what happens whenever you misplace your priorities. You, you do it thinking that these things are going to make you happy, uh, thinking that, these things are going to make a difference in your life. However, you'll soon find that it just doesn't deliver what it promised you that it would deliver. And in a world with so many options, this hits home that we want to watch all the shows and listen to all the podcasts and do all the things and eat at every new restaurant and find all the new trendy spots. But when we do it, we find out it just doesn't quite deliver what we hoped it would deliver. So Haggai has had a very simple message here to the people. You say it's not time to build God's house, yet you're, you're making priority of building your own house, and it's not fulfilling you, it's not satisfying you, and it's not helping you. And so you've got to find a way to prioritize God's house because that's where you'll find your own fulfillment. You know, Landon, as I'm I'm listening to you break this story open, I I, I I'm tempted to just say, okay, step back here and look at the big picture for a minute. I mean, I don't know how many of our students have tried to do difficult things before, but in fairness, this generation's coming back from, you know, Babylonian captivity. They, their homes have been destroyed. Everything has been, you know, laid waste. And now they're having an opportunity to come back. You know, you could cut them some slack, right? It's like, man, I get it. It's like, you got to have a house to live in. You have to shelter your family. So they get back, they lay the foundations. They start like with a focus on God, but pretty quickly because of the rain or because of the necessity, the urgence, uh, urgency, of needing a shelter, they're pulled off task and they begin to build their own houses. Okay, who can who could hold that against them, right? That's I don't think God would be up there saying, "Hey, you should have been putting, you know, paneling on at the church, you know, and your your children out in the cold." But now we're sixteen years. <laughs> now I've got a few projects around the house that I've procrastinated, but I'm pretty sure that if I started a project and sixteen years later nothing has happened, then Cass probably going to be saying, okay, you're never going to do that. I mean, God sends a prophet to create this, build this fire, this sense of urgency, because an understandable distraction has turned into a habitual pattern of negligence. And, and it's like, this is not cool. Uh, and, and I was also thinking, as I was looking at that passage uh, that you were reading, that first part of Haggai, you know, people say, well, you know, maybe does, does time really matter to God? I mean, is it a big deal? You know, so 16 years later, but you look at the beginning of the passage and it's like in the six, second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, the first day of the month. I mean, <clears throat> okay, I'm thinking time matters to God. If he's keeping his calendar through the prophet to this level of, of uh, spe specificity, if that's a word, <laughs> uh it, time matters to God. So I'm, I'm thinking, what should the student take from what you're saying? It's like, first, time matters to God. And God always has to be first. I mean, they started well, but a, a, an understandable, as I said earlier, distraction becomes a, a unexplainable habitual pattern of negligence. And that's not cool for leaders. We have to understand there are times that we all, we all have families. We all have things that have to be done, but we've got to keep the main thing, the main thing, the big rocks that of your opening analogy. And, and honestly, just a few ideas about underscoring that. 
Yeah, so good. I, I'm glad you brought up how detailed that that timing is to God. Um, and it, I guess I felt a and uh, a little conviction thinking if God's like in the you know I turned 38 a couple of weeks ago, and if God is numbering my days and going, here's how I've what I've called you to do and what I've asked you to do, and and here we are in the 38th year, and here's the progress we've made based on. And it's not just about doing things. I, I, we're talking about spiritual maturity. We're talking about defeating uh, uh, sin and and habits in our lives. Like, there's just things that we've been called to do that it's so easy to put off for later. Just uh, I'll get to that eventually. And then God comes eventually says that at some point, you know, you've you built you've built your life now. When is God's house ever going to get? Uh, when's God's house ever going to get any any attention? Uh, you know, Jesus sort of picks up on the same message in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where he says this, he says, therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But like you said, there's nothing wrong with building your house, nothing wrong with clothes to wear, food to eat something to drink. The Gentiles, they seek after these things, and the Heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God, but seek first the house of God, his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek out material comforts. I I think God wants us to live blessed and full and abundant lives. He even says that, that he didn't, he came to give his life and life in abundance. So seek out the good times, seek out the experiences, go to the new restaurants, watch the shows, read the books, whatever it is that you want to do, go for the gusto, do it, enjoy it. But remember that it's not the first rock. It's not, it's the gravel that goes in around the big rocks. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Uh, one thing that he points out here is that whenever you have wrong priorities, it inevitably leads to anxiety. That if you're worried about food, you'll never have enough. If you're worried about money, you're always going to be in a, in a scarcity mentality. But if you focus on him, then you get all the stuff and you avoid the anxiety along the way. Uh, see God and his righteousness first, put in those big rocks. Uh, and here's what I see, three three really big rocks that, that, that are given to us in this passage. Uh, first, it says, seek first the kingdom of God. So our three, our first priority is, is just to seek God. Uh, our spiritual habits have to go in first. Our prayer has to go in first. If you wake up one morning and you have an option between skipping your prayer time or turning in a quiz late, Turn in the quiz late because it's the quiz is not a big rock. Prayer is a big rock. Uh, and the problem with it with the spiritual disciplines is that they're the things that are the most important, but would take the most amount of time for people to know that they're lacking. If you don't turn in something at work or, or, or if you don't show up for an assignment at church, people know that instantly. If you skip your prayer time, people don't know that instantly but they do know eventually. And so it, it's easy to skip out on those things uh, because they seem like there's no immediate gratification. But seek first the kingdom of God. Before you seek to be a leader, uh, before you seek to be uh, a person of influence, you first have to seek to be a disciple of Jesus, like someone who loves him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength loves your neighbor as yourself, like just a, com a complete seeker of God first. And in leadership, this is a dirty secret. Those of you who are starting your journey, this journey, it gets so easy to seek ministry first instead of God first, to, to seek advancement in the kingdom and advancement on the church hierarchy, to climb the church ladder first. But we're told first, seek the kingdom of God first. The first rock that has to go in, it's got to be my prayer. It's got to be my spiritual disciplines. It's got to be my, it's got to be my integrity. It has to go in first. Then he says, and seek the kingdom of God. So seek God and his righteousness. Now, 
what I love about that word righteousness in both Hebrew, uh, it's sedekah in Hebrew, and dikaiosune in Greek. And in both Hebrew and Greek, the word translated righteousness is also translated justice. So sometimes, depending on context, you'll see the word either sedekah in the Old Testament or dikaiosune in the New Testament, and it'll be translated righteousness, and sometimes it'll be translated justice, because from the Bible's perspective, they're two sides of the same coin. And a lot of Christians either emphasize righteousness or, or justice, but you can't have one without the other. Uh, let me explain. There are some Christians that are really concerned about personal morality and, and living a, uh, an upstanding, integrous life. And so they care a lot about your personal decisions. They, they care a lot about what you do and don't do. And that, that's important to God. But secondly, there is a, as an, an importance on justice, which is how you treat other people. And so some Christians kind of lax on the personal morality side, but real big on the social justice side of like, let's make sure that we're treating everyone with equity, fighting for the oppressed. And we get into these camps where we say, well, no, it's really about justice and really about righteousness, where the Bible literally has one word for both of them, that you cannot be a righteous person if you don't act justly to others, and you cannot act justly towards others unless you are in right standing with God that they are two sides of the exact same uh, coin. So what are my big rocks? It's seek God. And then I seek righteousness, which is a life of integrity and holiness before him. And I seek justice, which is me making sure that I'm putting the interest and the good of other people ahead of my own, uh, ahead of my own good. Those are the big rocks that have to come in first. Landon, if I could jump in, because I'm thinking, you know, even as you're talking, I'm thinking, God, I want to be like that. I, that's what I want. I, I want to be a righteous person. I, I want to to have. I want to have justice, and I want to have right standing with God. And sometimes that can seem. I'm just talking like a father now. It can seem like an insurmountable thing because you know there's always part of me that wants my own way. Wants you know I'm always battling that that war that rages. I think like we all are if we're living in the flesh between what I know I need and what my personal interest is. And, and I think the thought can come up in the mind is like, how do I ever reconcile the two? How do I, and I always have believed that it's a supernatural spiritual work. And let me just say it this way, is the heart can be adjusted. The heart can be adjusted by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can change our mind, can adjust our heart. But I told a group one time, and I believe it's true, that if you'll make Christ and his kingdom the focus of your attention, the Holy Spirit will make him the object of your affection. I'm just going to say that again. If you will make, because it's hard to make your affection. You think, well, I, I, you know, I just want these things, and it's natural. Okay, I get it. How do I change? You, you don't. You let the Holy Spirit change you. Do what you can do. You can make him the focus of your attention. And then the Holy Spirit will make him the object of your affection. And I think when the Holy Spirit begins to work in your want to, Paul said it this way, it's him working in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You know, he, in other words, he'll help us get our want to right. And he'll help us also perform what is right. But it's by his grace through the Holy Spirit that this is done. And so I think a lot of times we get so consumed trying to do the right thing and force our heart to conform to what we believe is right when we ought to be falling in love with Jesus and just being building this love affair with Christ, so to speak, if I can say it that way. And then it's amazing how priorities be, begin to realign themselves and adjust themselves when I'm so in love with Jesus that I'm, I'm that my passion for him compels me to do the things that you're talking about. Just a thought. That's that's great. And that's exactly what we're talking about. It's just putting those those priorities and those rocks in. And uh, so in church leadership and in serving in church, we often put a lot of stuff in the jar and try to manufacture a heart that wants to serve God. And you really can't do that. You have to you have to fall in love with him. And then from that love, the service flows. But whenever you prioritize service and on top of love, it, it just doesn't. It doesn't work that way. 
Uh, well, I want to take some questions. Uh, so if you, if any in the audience uh, want us to clarify something or I just want to um, uh, have anything, uh, we'll, we'll do that. But, but here's what I really want to do. Uh, so someone asked what, what was the third big rock? So it's, it's number one is seek first the kingdom of God. So that is, to me, it is putting your love, as you just said, Dr. Russell, the your love of God first. Secondly is his righteousness. So that to me is living a, an upstanding, morally right life. Uh, and the third one is justice, which is the same word as righteousness, but it, it presents a different side where I'm really seeking the good of other people. And if I make that the priority of my life, I mean, wow, if, if I could learn to truly love God, pursue holiness and love others as myself, uh, then uh, that we'd be mastering <laughs> the Christian life. Um, but specifically, we've got to do some things to keep the gravel out because, man, we live in a world full of gravel. And whether you realize it or not, or you desire it or not, it's so easy to fill our lives with things that are uh, urgent, but not important, as Stephen Covey uh, writes, uh, full of just just, just stuff. Um, and our schedules can get so full and so um, I, I kind of want to get into some practical things here uh, on on how to keep the gravel away, like, like how to keep those big rocks first. And so uh, if you feel free to, to jump in uh, at any point here, Dr. Brassfield, or if students, if you have questions about any of this, let, let us know. But how, how do we keep the big rocks in and prioritize the things of God, the things that lead to our holiness, our righteousness? Uh, the things that lead to us being the type of people who put others above ourselves. Uh, what? How, how do we do that? The first thing I think you need to do is you, you need to make a not-to-do list. A not-to-do list. As you mature, you don't grow with your yeses, you grow with your noes. Not, not your noes grow, but you grow by learning to say, I can't do that because I chose to do, I'm choosing to do this instead that every yes is a thousand no's. Uh, the fact that you agree to log on and watch this tonight means that you are missing dinner potentially with your family. That was a decision that you made to be here tonight. Uh, you, you are missing a, a show that you might've wanted to watch. There's something else you could have been doing that you were not doing because you chose to do this and hopefully you're not multitasking and trying to do both. But what happens whenever you take on a task like DLI, because you said yes to this, it means you have to say no to something else. There'll be things that you don't have time to do anymore. And you're going to frustrate yourself if you try to just keep cramming stuff in the vase. The only way to get this big rock in is to take some of the gravel out. So start asking yourself, what's on my not to do list? Maybe it's uh, some social obligations. Uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's a a, a project, a, a hobby. It's uh, television or, or whatever it might be. There's going to be some things that you just will have to say no to to fit this in. Uh, here's what I like to say: uh, No is a complete sentence. <laughs> like, no is all you have to say. Well, can you come over? No. <laughs> Do you want to hang out this weekend? No. <laughs> and sometimes as Christians, we feel this obligation to keep everyone happy and to overextend ourselves at the expense of our own sanity and well-being because we just haven't learned how to say no. So let me, I was, if I would do it right now, if I were you or before you go to bed tonight, write down what's on your not to do list. Like, what are you going to say? I, I just, to do the things that are important to me, I have to say no to other things. Um, yeah, go ahead. Landon, uh, I was just going to jump in and say, you know, back in the days, helping people with, and I'm not a financial guru or a fan, financial planner, but, you know, when you work with students over the years and, and churches and pastors, you get, you get brought into conversations. And, you know, uh, in a conversation once about financial management, uh, I mentioned to someone that, it's not, you know, it's not good to plan your spending when you get your paycheck. Yeah. It's like, I think most financial planners would tell you, name your money in advance, 
make those spending decisions in advance. And I think that's kind of the rule behind what you're saying about saying no and, and saying yes. It's like if, if, if you're waiting till someone proposes something, we can have that shiny object syndrome, right? And get pulled off task by chasing an opportunity. It, it makes us, and in a, in a kingdom building sense, there's a lot of people who are spiritual opportunists. And that's a dangerous way to plan your leadership and plan your life. It's so much more effective if you will make decisions in advance. How are you going to take your time? What, what's your schedule going to look like? You know, one of the keys that I've had done for years with Destiny is the first thing I, Kath and I had this conversation this morning. She said, what's your day look like? And because of the holiday yesterday, I said, I'm, I'm setting my week this morning. The first thing I'll do is set the rest of my week. You know, I'll make those decisions. Who am I going to talk to? What? Now, certainly things come up. There are things that are worked in, but the, back to your big rocks, I've made those decisions in advance. And so, you know, if, if you're waiting to decide whether you're going to do your studying on, you know, Wednesday night after Bible study or Thursday, and, and, you know, there's a good chance you'll do neither, <laughs> you know, unless you decide on Tuesday, okay, this are, these are the times that I've set aside for study and, and for, you know, doing this. And I, I think that's kind of the, what I'm hearing you say is, and, and the way I would interpret it is, is make your decisions in advance, be proactive about your schedule. When are your study times going to be? What are you going to be working on? What books are you going to read? And then you, you know, it's like you, uh, the old cliche, you, you plan your work and then work your plan. Yep. And you'll find you still have a lot of time for the gravel, which are those things that are, they're not bad things. They are just not the most important things. Uh, so there are a lot of things in my life that, that aren't, that aren't my top priorities that I have time for, but I have to make sure that the big rocks go in first. Um, I think let's, I got a, we got a great question here. What are the things we can say yes to that will yield the most fruit? Uh, so for me as God, you know, like just that making sure that it, that devotional time, prayer time, uh, remains a, a top priority, uh, family. Uh, I have learned that I just have no, if things aren't great at home, they're not going to be great at church either. Like I just, as an integrated person, as a fully integrated person, I know that I'm not functioning at my best anywhere. If I feel there's some tension or separation in my house. So that's that has to be a priority over everything else because I'm I, not only is it my first ministry, but it's just from a practical purpose. Like I'm not good anywhere if if I don't have that that support at home. Uh, I think physical health is another one for me, where uh, I I feel I feel better in every area of life whenever I'm physically fit, physically strong, and making that a priority, uh, as well as any kind of intellectual growth or development. That's another thing I have to say yes to, uh, because I, I'm just, I'm, I'm better at everything else if my mind is fully engaged. So I know you have, I, I'm sorry, I took all the good ones, but, uh, <laughs> what, what, what else would you say on top, on top of those, those, those big rocks to make sure we're saying yes to those things first? Yeah, I, I would, you know, I would probably want to back up just a little bit with the question that was, that was asked and say, maybe if we think about it differently, it will help to answer that. What do we say yes to? In other words, I'm looking down and, and I was looking over your notes and, and I see, you know, God, wife, kids, church, community, friends, health, the things you just went through that, that you mentioned. What if you looked at those like accounts, like bank accounts that you had to write checks on? Okay. Well, we all know that if you don't make a deposit in the account, you can only bounce checks for so long until it just doesn't work anymore. People won't take your check. They won't trust you. You know, uh, I think we say if, uh, to me, the things that's, that we should say yes to that will pay the biggest dividends are the things that we invest in. And if we look at that as an investment, well, I can't make a withdrawal in my relationship with Kath, my wife, if I've not made an investment into that relationship, I, I don't get much out of church if I don't make an investment in that relationship. Same thing with God. We've all been in that moment where I haven't had time to pray. I haven't really stopped God. I've been busy. 
And then suddenly something happens and I try to go to prayer and by his grace, he hears it, but there's that natural resistance because we're trying to pull, you know, resource out of an account we haven't invested in. So I would say to that question is the, 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 the things you say yes to think about your yeses as an investment into them that then you will draw from. And then, and then answer the question, is it a yes or is it a no? You know, obviously, if I if I'm going to make the biggest withdrawal from my wife in that relationship, then I need to make the biggest investment there, you know. And so, yeah, another hunting trip, another fishing trip. I mean, some of that helps with my relationship with her. But then there's that point where I'm spending relationship capital I haven't invested. And so, I, I mean, that's that's just how I would look at it, not just to say, OK, well, here's one or here's one. I mean, I think we could go through a list and I'm happy to do that. But I think maybe a way to approach the answer to that question is stepping back and saying, OK, wait a minute, let's rethink this and think that the things you're saying yes to are the things you need to draw from. Good. Very good. And I, and I think as you grow in your leadership as well, that conversation changes because there are stages where you have to say yes to almost everything and you need to uh, whenever you have a heart to serve god to, hey can can someone stay and mop the floor tonight yep i can can someone clean the bathroom absolutely there's no one in the nursery uh can yeah i'll, I'll do it and god sees that and whenever god sees that willing heart there's normally an, an elevation in your life where you begin to get other opportunities eventually there becomes a place where there's just more opportunities than you have capacity. And that's when you have to start choosing yeah. your guesses. And, you know, for those of us in pastoral leadership, we know how hard that is where there's sometimes meetings that you used to be able to take and you're just not able to take them at the, at the same way anymore. And, and everyone used to be able to have your phone number, uh, but now you realize like if I give everyone my number, then I don't actually get to talk to the people that are, yes. you know, that, that are, are most important. And so it's finding, it, it changes over time. So, man, there's such a balance here that I want us to be able to hit because I, I, I am aware that because of our sinful desire, it can be so easy to say, well, anything that I don't want to do, I get to say no to, and I'm protecting myself. Like I'm, 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 I'm saving my yes for God's best. You know what? Someone's got to change the diaper. Someone's got to clean the toilet. Someone's got to open up. Someone's got to close the place down. And if you're ever too good to do any of those things, you're completely missing the point. It's really where your heart is. And your heart has to be like, I want to do the things that God has called me to do. And I have to say no to some other things in order to do that. I think that's about time management and really is our topic for tonight. But yet there is a sense where we have to guard against sanitizing our selfishness with some sort of religious or spiritual disguise by just saying, oh, well, I chose to pray tonight while y'all set the tables up or I chose to, I'm choosing the better part. You know, I'm choosing to go in the worship room while y'all, you know, while y'all uh, change all the diapers and do that's not the heart of the Lord. And we don't want to sanitize our selfishness with a religious excuse. You know, we want to be, you know, Paul says, I'm both ready to spend and be spent, you know, and if you're never willing to be spent, then you right. really don't have the right, the, the, the righteous right to to spend. There comes a time in your development as a leader where you will have to make those hard choices. You can't do everything with everybody all the time and be good at anything. I get that. But I think we also have to be careful and guard against the, again, sanitizing our selfishness. Right. And there's a, and this is where the art of delegation also comes in. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a later webinar where we talk specifically about, about how to delegate. But usually that means that there will come a place where you have to, things that you used to do, you can't do anymore, but they still have to be done. And so finding a way to say, I, you know, I, I, I love doing this. Uh, it happened this semester. I, like I, we, we, we onboarded some new DLI instructors and I opened up courses for them to take and someone took my favorite. I, I won't say which course it is. I don't make anybody feel bad, <laughs> but like someone took a course that I love to teach, but at the rate that DLI is growing, I can't teach all the courses and and drive all the content and and steer this whole ship. So I had to let something go, which meant I had to let something go that I really enjoy doing. 
is delegating isn't always just about getting rid of the things you don't want to do. A lot of times it's like, hey, for the good of the organization, for the good of where God's taken my life, I have to give up something that I I do like to do. Um, mm. So I think, we've all, I think we've all had to do that at times in ministry, be, be willing to let go of something. And even if you know you do it better, sometimes it's not about the fact that, that wow, I, I'm really the best man or woman for the job. Sometimes that that's if you have exclusively a performance mindset, then that's the decisions you'll make. But one of the things we've advocated with Destiny over the years is we both do good ministry, but we train great leaders. And that means we have to be willing to compromise a little bit on perhaps who's best for the job because this person needs to do that. They'll never get to your level of competence if you don't let them take the job and do it. And so when you have a both and philosophy instead of an either or, well, it's either all about performance or it's all about development. No, I think we have to do both. But to do that means we have to delegate sometimes things that we are maybe even better at. But for this, as you say, the sake of the organization and its future, we've got to train up some other people that can do that by letting them try. Right. And I know when you talk about this, often people think, well, I'm I'm not at that kind of executive level, so it doesn't really apply to me. Well, yeah, it does. I mean, if you if you lead the greeter team at your church, at some point, you have to stop being the person who's opening the doors and and working on training people who will open the doors. And so at every level of leadership, as God continues to expand your influence, there's a there's a no that you have to that has to accompany the yes. In this context, we're talking about really making space in your life for DLI. There's just going to be a lot of things that you're going to have to learn to say no to. So I think we've, and we've hit a lot of my other points that I wanted to make, but let's just hit a couple more uh, briefly. So the first thing I want you to do is make a not to do list. What, what are you going to say no to? Secondly, I want you to get it out of your head, uh, meaning write it down somewhere. Uh, as you said, Dr. Brassfield, you you start your week by making a calendar. Uh that is a, it's a lost art, but trust me, if you do not plan your days, someone will plan them for you. So you have to get it out of your head, uh, put all, every task down on a, on a list. I can't tell you how many times uh, I've been making a, a list of things to do. And about the 15th thing on the list, I go, that's really important. And, then, and I need to do that. And, that. and that was supposed to be done last week. And it completely slipped my mind. Because if if not, I'll wake up and the phone will ring and I'll I'll take the kids to school and then I'll I'll head to a meeting that lasts it's an, an hour long meeting but it lasts an hour and forty five minutes and now it's lunchtime and I'm I can't think when I'm hungry and you know and, and then you get the end of the day going well what did I do today so it so you you get it out of your head you write it down uh, hey hey Landon let yes, me sir. just tell you I mean you know this probably you've been in my office a million times. I created a sheet that has a slot for the date. It has a list of contacts. It has a list of things to do and a list of things to follow up on. And I've, I've used that for years. I keep them. And if, if you want to have a fun exercise, those of you who haven't done this, just keep them, date them. And then as you're, so how do I start my, my list of things to do this week? I start with last week's list. And anything, I, I'm, so I'm constantly triaging, creating priorities. And and so my, my point in jumping in is to say, don't just do like a back of a napkin. I mean, I guess that's better than nothing. But if you really want to maximize this, create a system and then work your system. And it's amazing how things won't fall through the cracks. It'll maximize your time. It'll cause you things that go from one week to the other typically are really important. You know, and so at some point in time, you say, hey, that's been on three of these weeks list. It's getting done today because it's going to get off the list. So it's I mean, I think it's important. I couldn't agree more. Make a list, but then work your list with a strategy. I've done it for years and it helps immensely. And calendar blocking, I think someone in the chat mentioned that earlier. So what that looks like is that whenever if you're going to do your DLI work and you say from from four to six, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm doing DLI. You put it in your calendar, just like it's an appointment with a person. So if someone says, hey, can you grab coffee Tuesday at 4.30? I'm sorry, I can't, I'm, I'm booked. <laughs> like I, I've, I've, got, I've got an appointment already. Now you don't have to tell them that it's an appointment with yourself, but it is an appointment and it is a, uh, it, it is 
because here's what's going to happen is if you if you don't prioritize when it happens, you're going to take that coffee at 430. And now you still have your DLI work to done to do. And because you said yes to coffee, now you've said no to hanging out with your family that night. Uh, and you didn't realize you were doing it when you did it, but it just it's just naturally what ha- what happened. So calendar blocking is great. We're like, I have parts of my week that are designed for deep work. And I try not to take meetings, appointments. I try to keep my phone on do not disturb. I'm I'm not, I'm not near as perfect as this as I, as I would like to be. But it is about about making priority. And uh, let me give you a, a, a couple of other short points, and then we'll wrap this thing up. But we can also uh, lose time just by not capitalizing on the time that we do have. Because sometimes you can't find that two-hour block. But, you know, you can listen to an audio book uh, on your way to work, uh, at, like as you commute, living here in Houston, everywhere I go is at least 30 minutes. So I've, I've got to find a way to redeem that time by either phone calls or or, list, or listening to an audio book. Um, early mornings, man, if you, can, if you can rework your life to go to bed early and wake up early, let me tell you something. Nobody wants you between 5 and 7 a.m. in the morning. You can do whatever you want. Uh, now, between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. at night, a lot of people want your attention. A lot of things are happening, but nobody <laughs> needs you. Uh, and I know there'll be an exception, you know, if you're a nurse or something. But like, uh, I've learned that that prioritizing early mornings and knowing if I can get my big task done before my first meeting of the day, then it's going to be a good day. And that's a, a goal that I that I usually have. Uh and then finally, I would say schedule margin and rest. Like, and I'll and I'll wrap up there. Uh, schedule margin and rest. Don't don't try to be so productive, so efficient uh, that you treat yourself like a machine instead of a person. Um, God, uh, He instituted the Sabbath, um, but if you if you schedule every minute of every day to be the most productive being you are, then you're not really a human anymore. You're more like a machine. And I think a lot of the productivity literature and systems and techniques offered to us kind of they make us feel less than human you know where there's got to be there's got to be time for a for a nap whenever you're tired or or to sit on the couch and watch something for a few you know you've got to you got to have that that margin uh but that means that in the time you're working you really got to work so that when the time you're resting you can truly rest good stuff you think that's No, good good stuff there. Uh, you know, I, I think as, as I'm kind of going back to your context with Haggai and Zachariah, you know, there's just a couple things that I would say, okay, if if I were going to just wrap up my ideas and thoughts, because there's so much good stuff that you've shared. What are the takeaways from those two books? Because really they have the same mission. You know, kind of Haggai comes a little bit with a hammer and Zachariah uh, comes with a blessing and a promise, you know, but their goal is to motivate the people. Um, And I I think as I was kind of thinking through it, I I just jotted out a few ideas. Number one is future blessing is based on current obedience. Don't forget that what you're doing is going to make a difference. You it's back to the investment. You invest in the study with DLI. You are going to reap the purpose of God. And so that was the message. I mean, of both of these prophets, if you'll take the time to put God first and build his house, then he will release blessing in your life. And then uh, of course the message was to build the temple because the Messiah will inhabit your work. That was the message really of Zechariah is you're not just building a, a building, you're building the house of God. You're building, he will inhabit your work. And I would just say to the students, as we kick off this semester is future blessing is based on current obedience, be obedient, what you've committed, follow through and finish and understand that you're building something in you that the Messiah will inhabit. He will live in your work. So good. So good. That's a great place to wrap it up. Uh, Thank you everyone for logging in tonight. I hope this has been helpful for you. Uh, Dr. Brassel, brilliant as always. Thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, what a great way to to kick it off if you have any questions about your work feel free to reach out to us Um, if this is your first semester 
please be patient with us and with yourselves. Uh, there's a learning curve for all of us. Uh, it, getting used to a new system can be a challenge, so don't don't give up. Uh, don't grow weary. If if you have a problem, be sure to reach out to us and let us help you. And then at the same time, if if you feel like there's something not right on our end, you can't get a quiz to work. A syllabus has a misspelled word. Just we're our, our small team is working as hard as we can too. So be patient with yourself. Be patient with us. We're going to have a great semester. God bless you guys.